Yeah. So on behalf of the MIT Club of Rhode Island, welcome to our Zoom speaker event. Uh, we have with us Dr. Edward Hoffer. Welcome, Dr. Hoffer. We're very pleased that you're able to join us. Uh, as I had mentioned, please, uh, please uh, mute your phones if you're calling in or your laptops uh, as this event will be recorded. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Hoffer, who is the author of Prescription for Bankruptcy, A Doctor's Perspective on America's Failing Healthcare System and How We Can Fix It. Uh, and we're very interested in his thoughts and his views on the shortfalls uh, of our current system. Um, Dr. Hoffer spent uh, his professional career combining clinical practices with cutting edge research in the area of medical informatics. Uh, his work in this field began during his formal training with the Massachusetts General Hospital, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Um, his work, or I should say his early work with LCS focused on using computers for teaching purposes. Uh, he developed a library of educational software and distributed by links to the LCS computers. Um, Dr. Hoffer's key contributions have been in the development, maintenance, testing and expansion of the, the explaining a diagnostic decision support system, which is extensively uh, used at Harvard and other medical schools by practicing physicians and by institutions around the world. Dr. Hoffer earned his SB from MIT and his medical degree from Harvard Medical School and completed his residency training in medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. So uh, with Dr. Hoffer's permission, I'm going to read a, a few excerpts from his book. Um, the US healthcare system is badly broken and we know that, don't we? We spend more, much more per capita on healthcare than any other country on earth. And yet our national health statistics are nowhere near the top. In 2017, the US population was 324 million and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services estimated that our national health spending had reached 3.5 trillion. The US has poor child health outcomes than our other wealthy nations. In 2013 article on the US healthcare system, Time Magazine reported that a child born in Havana, Cuba had a better chance of living to age two than a child born in the United States. A document uh, in the US today reports that in July 20, 2018, the maternal death rate in the US is dramatically worse than it is in other developing nations. And for those of us who are 65, uh, which I am not, I'm not 65 yet, but uh, who are enrolled in Medicare might think that, you know, they're safe from the ruinous medical costs, but it's not necessarily true. There are people who will incur out-of-pocket costs for medical, medical care at averaging $122,000 uh, between the age of 70 until death. And for those unlucky enough to have a serious illness, about 5% will experience out-of-pocket costs of more than $300,000. At the same time, while we're witnessing, you know, huge advances in scientifically and technologically, uh, we are also seeing costs spiral out of control um, the early advances such as antibiotics that gave us very big bang for the buck with cures costing just a few dollars. Disease prevention through immunization has been very cost effective. As a practicing physician for almost 45 years, he's watched science become much more sophisticated and the ability to help patients vastly improve. So while our system of delivering care de has deteriorated at an equally rapid pace, the lingering question is, what is wrong and how can it be improved? And with that, Dr. Hoffer, welcome. Thank you very much, Juan. I, I have been in this business for quite a while. I've celebrated my, uh, uh, not only my 50th from MIT, but my 50th from Harvard Medical School. So I have seen dramatic changes on the scientific side 
enormous progress. I mean, when I was an intern, if you came in with a heart attack, we basically put you to bed and watched you. Uh, we didn't do much more than would have been done uh, in the 1700s. Nowadays, if you have a heart attack, you go in, you get an angioplasty, and you go home the next day cured. So that is a very positive. Uh, in parallel with that, I've also seen business, seen medicine turn from what was really a calling to what is a business where people are in it more for uh, uh, venture capital firms making money than to help people. So I'd like to spend some time going over all, all of this. I am going to shorten, you know, the, my standard talk is runs about an hour. I'm going to try to skip over a few things so we can have adequate time for discussion and questions at the end. Uh, I would like to uh, start off with a, a sort of summary and uh, the instigation for that was a story I heard about a uh, a legendary uh, rabbi in Russia in the 19th century who was a world-renowned expert on the Talmud, that very, very dense, uh, complicated compilation of Jewish teachings. And he was lecturing one day and a Cossack strode in and said, I understand you're an expert on the Talmud. Uh, if you can teach me the entire Talmud while I stand on one leg, I'm going to convert to Judaism. And uh, his pupil said, oh, ignore that, that man, Rabbi, he's just, he's here to just to disrupt us. And the rabbi said, no, he said, lift up your leg, son. The Talmud says, honor God in everything you do every day and treat your fellow man as you wish to be treated. That's the Talmud. Everything else is just commentary and uh, discussion. So I am going to show you the essence of my talk in one picture. And this is a slide taken from a recent article in the New England Journal. And you can see that on the one axis is life expectancy at birth, which is a sort of surrogate uh, summary of, of a, the health of a nation. And on the other axis is uh, expenditures per capita on health care. And the curve is pretty good, except for that one little outlier that uh, happens to be the good old US of A, where we spend dramatically more money than any other country in the world. And yet our health, health outcomes are down there along with Poland and Turkey and not much higher than Mexico, Latvia, nowhere up, nowhere near the uh, modern European countries that should be our peers. So this is, this is the basic problem that we are dealing with. We're a major, major outlier. You know, we spend about $11,000 per capita on healthcare in this country. Uh, Western European countries, Canada, Japan, spend less than half of that. Uh, GDP, we spend 18% of our gross domestic product on healthcare, while in most comparable countries, it's around 10, 11%. Uh, does this matter? Yeah, it means that there's 8% of our GDP that is spent on healthcare that isn't spent on infrastructure, on education, on a variety of other things that uh, could be, that money could be spent on. You could argue, okay, well, you know, we're a rich country, we can afford to spend lots of money because after all, we've got the best healthcare in the country in the world. This is a graph. The yellow line on the bottom is the overall uh, consumer price index starting 1960 going up to uh, 2016. The red line is the healthcare cost index. And you can see for the first for, through 1960 through about 1980, they went roughly in parallel. I mean, clearly costs are going to go up. We don't expect to pay 50 cents a gallon for gas or, uh, you know, get a 10 cent hamburger. But 
if medical health care costs parallel the consumer price index, we'd be currently spending roughly half of what we are spending. As noted earlier, you know, we have actually lousy outcomes. Our life expectancy at birth is about five years below that of comparable Western democracies. It was actually falling through much of the mid-teens, went up a glorious 0.1 a year in 2019, and then went down again you know, with COVID and with the opioid epidemic went down again in 2020. Um, maternal death. I mean, a lot of, as I'll cover a little bit later, not all of our bad health outcomes are at the healthcare system. I mean, there are a number of other factors, socioeconomic and personal behaviors that impact uh, how, what our health is. But maternal death rate is one that is very much in the wheelhouse of medicine. You know, they, in an ideal world, no healthy young woman giving birth should die. It's not an ideal world and there are gonna be some deaths. But again, if you look at comparing us with Western Europe, Canada, Japan, our maternal death rate is three, four times that of these other countries. And this is an embarrassment and a disgrace. The only area in which good old USA is number one is that, and this is probably one of the few developed countries where healthcare costs are a leading cause of poverty. You know, you talk to anybody in any other country as has been done about, you know, would you like to trade your system for the American system? And you will almost universally get God no. And the reason is that in most countries of the world, healthcare is considered a right. It is considered that you know, basic healthcare is something that the government owes to its citizens. And only in the US is it something that's sort of thought of as a consumer product that you know, if you're rich enough or lucky enough, uh, you can get it. And if you're unlucky or you're poor, well, that's too bad. You know, it's a leading cause of people having their credit scores dropped and it sort of spirals somebody who ends up not being able to pay their hospital bill and gets uh, dinged on their credit report. Now, all of a sudden, their mortgage rates, their auto loans, everything gets more expensive. And, you know, some 40 percent of working adults said that they had lower credit scores because of medical debt. A uh, study that came out a few years ago looking at women with advanced breast cancer and fully half of them had already been contacted by a collection agency over medical bills. Uh, a study that came out in the American Journal of Medicine earlier this year said that 42% of all cancer patients had basically exhausted all of their disposable income within two years of their cancer diagnosis. And as a, in a rich country, to my mind, this is unconscionable. You know, is it the fact that we actually just waste all our time going to doctors and get too much health care? No, it isn't. Uh, Europe, in Europe, they actually see doctors about 50, 55 percent more often than Americans do. They go to their hospitalized more than we do. It is not anything to do with the fact that we overuse healthcare. It's the fact that the healthcare we do use is grossly overpriced. The country is getting older, older people, no great shock, have more health issues, tend to spend more on healthcare. And that is true in this country, but it's true around the world, including all the countries that do a much better job than we do. A friend of mine was in Nice a few years ago, thought he had thrown out a disc, went into an imaging center, got a CAT scan of his spine, paid the equivalent of $200 out of pocket for the scan. The average price in this country is seven times higher than that. Uh, I had, we had another friend, a couple, they were in Paris, she fell down, broke her hip, went to a leading 
academic Paris hospital, had her hip replaced, came back. And uh, at that point, the, you know, the entire cost, and that included not only hospital doctor, but uh, home care, home PT and everything, visiting nurses was the equivalent of $8,000 US. The average price for the hospital alone in this country would be about 38,000. Perfectly good, same equipment, good result. Angioplasty, five times the average cost in this country as it is in Europe. And again, it's not that we do it better. Angioplasty was invented in Switzerland. They do it just as well as we do, but they do it at a fifth of the cost. The other thing, and this is if it's a subject that interests you, there's a whole school at Dartmouth Medical School that looked at uh, small area uh, health and health costs. And the totally unexplainable phenomenon is that within the United States, there is enormous variation in what people are charged for medical procedures having zero relationship to quality. I mean, you can expect if you're going to the Mayo Clinic or Mass General, yeah, you might have to pay a little more than if you're going to the elsewhere general. But in fact, the costs that are put through bear no relationship whatsoever to, to quality. Uh, so, you know, every hospital has a, you know, a book price for a procedure, which the various insurers negotiate down from, but uh, the list price, which actually is what you would be charged if you happen to go in with uh, no insurance and, uh, and some assets, uh, can vary tenfold on things like uh, you know coronary bypass. Hospital that's doing it for 44,000 presumably is not losing money. So how do you explain the hospital that's charging almost half a million for the same procedure? Somebody looked at the price of a routine appendectomy in California hospitals. And again, price range, believe it or not, from 1,500 to $182,000 for a very, very basic simple procedure where people are typically out of the hospital in two days. You wanna be sure you're comparing apples to apples and you're getting only good quality hospitals. Somebody looked at uh, National Cancer Institution certified cancer centers. What do they charge to take out a cancerous thyroid? And the range is anywhere from 3,000 to 23,000. Again, all high quality hospitals. COVID just brought out a lot of the, these disparities. Uh, Kaiser Health News uh, looked at the, what was charged for a uh, COVID test, which cost somewhere around $45 for the ingredients and to run it. And depending where you went, the, you, you were being charged anywhere from $20 to $1,400. With the average, you know, with a, if you go into an urgent care center, most of them are charging over 1,000. The exact same site in, uh, in a place in Austin, if you walked in and said, I want a COVID test and I'll write you a check, it was 200 bucks. If you said, here's my insurance card, they chart billed it out at $6,400 and actually ended up getting paid over 900 for tests that you know, cost, uh, cost them something under 50. All right, why are we so expensive? Uh, there's lots and lots of uh, bad actors in this, and uh, there's a blame, enough blame to share all around. One of them is the enormous administrative cost in this country, which is unparalleled. Roughly 25% of our, in quotes, healthcare spending doesn't go to healthcare, it goes to administrative overhead. About half of that to the insurance companies, and about half the cost to hospitals and doctors of, of just sending out bills and collecting. The healthcare employment, as we'll see shortly, is growing up dramatically, but it's not growing in doctors and nurses, it's growing in administrators. Typical US health insurance company takes about 15% of the premium for overhead and profit. Medicare, which runs at least as well, 
spends a little less than 2% on overhead and profit. If we could just get the insurer health insurance around generally to cut their overhead down to Medicare rates, we could save you know, billions and billions of dollars. One example, two comparable hospitals, one in the US, one in Canada, Duke University, which is a teaching hospital, employs 1,500 people in their billing department. Montreal General, which is a similar size hospital in Canada, gets by with 10. And uh, so again, that those 1,490 patient billing clerks don't help you feel any better. Where's your money going? This shows a graph of physicians. I don't I could do a similar one for nurses, which is the dark red on the bottom, and administrative personnel, which is the lighter pink. So you can see where the growth is coming. And again, I would contend that there are very few billing clerks that help you get better, faster, or feel better. Hospitals. Hospitals are the largest single cost in our system. And unfortunately, unlike most industries, healthcare does not offer an economy of scale. Ultimately, a healthcare interaction is a doctor and or a nurse, or maybe more than one with a patient. And yes, you can do a few, you can do some teaching things that in a group setting, but for the most part, patient care is very much one-on-one. -on -one. And simply what happens is you get larger and larger organizations, is you get larger and larger administrative layers. You know, when I started in this business, the typical hospital had a, an administrator, it had a, uh, a chief of nursing and a chief financial officer, and usually have somebody who ran the housekeeping side of the hospital. And that was the, uh, that was the administrative part of it. Now you have CEOs, presidents, vice presidents, assistant vice presidents, all up and down the line all getting very generous salaries, all with their own offices, all with their own staffs. And again, minimal evidence that any of this does any good for anybody. Um, the thing that we're seeing more and more is that the doctors are getting worn out by demands for more and more paperwork. They're giving up selling their practices to hospitals. And what happens immediately is that prices go up dramatically. Uh, John Lil, 10 years ago, roughly a quarter of, of physicians were hospital employed. In 2021, half our hospital employees are part of a larger system. Um, what typically happens is the same charge for the same service goes up anywhere from 50 to 100%. Uh, I know this happened in, in Framingham where I was working, you know, a, a cardiology office sold to the hospital. The only thing that changed from the patient's perspective was the, the label on the door. Personnel were the same, equipment was the same, but a, a test that well, you know used to be charged 800 was now 2200. Same equipment, same, technician, same doctor reading it, and all this extra money went into hospital overhead. Um, emergency departments, I'm going to go over this fairly quickly in the interest of time, but they are one of the leading causes of surprise medical bills. You may have read over, about this over the last year or two. It's become a big issue. You're very careful, do your homework. You go to a place that you know is in your insurance company's network and lo and behold, you get a, an out of network bill. And what's happened is that specialists that know that patients don't really choose them and emergency physicians, anesthesiologists, pathologists, radiologists who, who actually are by force getting your business often will say, hey, we'll, we will opt out of the insurance company, we'll charge what we want to charge, and uh, tough luck. Uh, and of course, a lot of uh, 
of these groups are now being owned by venture capital firms who look upon this as a great way to, to make lots and lots of money. Good healthcare systems in high performing countries are primary care based. Ideally, at least half of the physicians in a country ought to be primary care, do most of what you need. In this country, it's topsy-turvy and only less than a third of uh, physicians are primary care and those that are are getting underpaid, overworked, burned out, in many cases, retiring early. You go to your primary care doctor with heartburn, they ask you a few questions, decide this has not got any red flags, anything to really worry about. They give you a prescription for an acid reducing medicine and say, call me in a few weeks if you're not feeling much better. You take the same complaint to a gastroenterologist. He says, well, we ought to take a look down your esophagus. He puts a scope down your esophagus. You, somebody gets billed three or $4,000 and he then says, I'm gonna give you an acid reducing medication and if you don't feel better in three or four weeks, call me. Um, coronary angioplasty, which has been a lifesaver for acute heart attacks is seriously overused. There's ample data, which most doctors are aware of that if you have stable angina, if you have coronary disease that's mild, and not getting any worse, you'll live just as long with medical treatment as with angioplasty. But you go to a cardiologist, he says, oh, look, here's a narrowed artery, I can fix that. He takes a very brave patient to say, oh, no, thank you, I don't want you to fix it. You know, so you get it fixed and uh, you're now on some blood thinners for life and you don't live on average a day longer. Malpractice system, again, we could probably spend half an hour going over that, but I'm not going to. Uh, it's a great system for lawyers. It is a lousy system for both patients and doctors. The uh, system drains a huge amount of money out of the system that uh, should go to patients, but a large chunk of it goes either to lawyers and to the expenses. If you have a clear cut malpractice, but the lawyer says, oh, we're only gonna get you $50,000, it's not worth my time. You know, they want the, uh, the bad babies, you know, the multi-million dollar cases where they, uh, where they can go home with, uh, with a quarter of that. From a clinician's viewpoint, uh, one of the worst aspects is that the adversary system encourages people to hide things if they can get away with it. Every doctor makes mistakes. Good doctors learn from their mistakes, try not to do them a second time, try to help other people not do them. But if you know that you made a mistake and it's probably not gonna get found out, and you know that if you bring it out, you're gonna get sued, tendency is, okay, I'm not gonna let anybody else learn from this. I'm just gonna keep it quiet and Patient's probably going to be okay, so let's not rock the boat. Pharmaceuticals. Uh, if you really want uh, the poster child for greed, uh, pharmaceuticals, while not as large a chunk of the overall spending, is a dramatic way of showing how much worse we are than any other country in the world. I pulled off some random commonly used medications, compared the average wholesale price in the US and in Canada. And if you just look at these, you can see we're spending four or five times as much for, for these medications as they are in Canada. No wonder that people are taking caravans from Detroit to go across the river into Canada to buy their insulin. Um, I don't know if any of the name Martin Scraggly rings any bells. He was sort of the uh, poster child of pharmaceutical greed. Uh, a medication called Daraprim is, was, a, so, was a somewhat of an orphan drug. It was used to treat a rare but very serious infection called toxoplasmosis. And if you have that, you either take the medication or you die. And the price, it was charged fairly stiffly at a 13 bucks a pill, way more than manufacturing costs. 
But when Mr. Scragley's company bought the rights to it, he raised it to $750. Didn't do any research, didn't do anything, just bought the company, said, I've got a pill you have to take or you're going to die, and it's now going to cost you $750 bucks a pill. Did anybody do it? Yeah, they, the Congress brought him in and raked him over the coals, didn't affect do anything, didn't drop the price. Pharmaceutical companies like to claim that they need these prices for their R&D, and they do need some money for R&D, but they in fact spend much more on marketing than they do on R&D. A lot of the research and development is actually done under NIH funding, done by academia, and the pharmaceutical companies really take over and commercialize rather than go do the basic research. A major problem we're seeing more and more, especially in the area of cancer care, is drugs that are being approved by the FDA. And maybe in the discussion period, we can get into that new drug that's just been approved for Alzheimer's disease. But uh, cancer drugs are now frequently approved, not because they show that people live longer or feel better, but are what are called surrogate outcomes. Some uh, you know, something on an image gets a little smaller, some biomarker in the blood gets a little better, and the FDA approves the drug at a cost of $100,000 a year without anybody actually having shown that it helps patients in the long run. They also spend a lot of time increasing demand. You know, you've all seen those wonderful Pharmaceutical ads on television starts off in black and white with a very unhappy person with some illness. And then they take this magic pill and the screen turns to living color and the person is smiling and playing with their grandchildren. Uh, and then they read the side effects at the end so quickly you can't understand them. We are one of the only two countries in the entire world that allow direct-to-consumer advertising. And uh, I think it is probably ought to be banned. Um, another great marketing expense is sending attractive young people. When I started, they were always attractive young women because doctors were mostly male. Now that we have 50-50 mix, they have attractive young men and attractive young women going in to visit doctors, bringing lunch for the whole office. And by the way, let me tell you about this wonderful new drug doctor. Uh, doctors like to say, and they may even like to believe that they're not, in, not affected by this kind of marketing. Unfortunately, there's very solid data showing an almost linear relationship between numbers of lunches consumed and numbers of prescriptions written. So it may be subliminal, but it works. You know, not only does it cost a lot of money, but about half of high risk ill people on Medicare stop their medications for at least some of the time because they simply couldn't afford it. And these were all specifically looked at as people who were at risk of hospitalization or rehospitalization because of their illness. The last group you'd want skipping medications because, uh, because they couldn't afford them. Misdiagnosis is a particular interest of mine. I've spent many decades trying to help doctors make more accurate diagnoses. Uh, it is an enormous problem that is not well appreciated either by the profession or by most patients that the National Academy released a white paper pushing eight years back now that said that roughly 5% of outpatient visits are going, there's going to be a misdiagnosis. A lot of them fortunately are, don't result in harm, uh, but some of them do. And they estimated that every one of us in our lifetime would be affected by a misdiagnosis either directly or, uh, or, a, uh, or an immediate family member. Uh, over the last hundred years, continuing up to today, 
autopsy studies very consistently show that about 10% of hospital deaths are caused at least in part by a failure to diagnose. And we just have not impacted that problem. There are lots of reasons for misdiagnosis. Uh, maybe patient didn't give information that was important. It may have been the doctor did a cursory physical exam. An x-ray may be misread, but the commonest single cause is simply the doctor didn't think of it. They're too busy. They hit upon something that seemed logical. They closed their mind and forward we go. Uh, there are a number of very good uh, computer-based aids out there, not only the one that we've worked on, but several others that, that would help, but they are underused and, and there needs to be a push to, to do more of it. Lest you uh, watching think that you're off the hook and it's all somebody else doing something to you, it isn't, you've got to, you've got to share in the blame. Uh, poor health habits. The study that uh, looked at five important good health habits, good diet, not smoking, either not drinking or drinking modestly, exercising regularly and keeping your weight down. These, if you, the more of these you did, the less cancer, the less heart disease, the longer you lived. And they calculated that for an average 50 year old woman who scored five out of five on these good habits would live 14 years longer than someone who was zero out of five. For men, 12 years longer. You know, if we could come up with a surgical procedure or a drug that would let you live 14 years longer, the inventor would be off to Stockholm getting in their Nobel prize. And yet it is things that you can do yourself without needing to spend any money. Another reason that the US lags poorly is one that again, we could spend a full hour on going into the details, but uh, the US fascination with guns means that we have homicide rates, suicide rates that are dramatically higher than they should be. Uh, the opioid epidemic is taking many, many lives of particularly men in their working years motor vehicle accidents. Uh, US teens have about double the death rate of, uh, of teens in Europe. And it's not because they're getting cancer or getting heart disease, it's uh, drugs and guns and cars. And so again, not a whole lot the healthcare system can do about that. So exercise, you don't have to be a marathon runner getting out doing a good brisk walk for 30, 40 minutes a day will get you the best bang for your buck. Another area that's really out of the healthcare system control, though a lot of healthcare systems are starting to nibble at the edges on this, are the so-called social determinants of health. You know, it has been estimated that somewhere close to 80% of the health outcomes broadly measured of any country are not determined by the healthcare system, but by factors like poor housing, poor nutrition, bad transportation, poverty. That both in the US and in other countries, including countries that have universal healthcare, you can correlate results and income. In Britain, in Denmark, if you have a if you get a have a heart attack and go home, your survival correlates almost linearly with your income, uh, just as it does in this country. Here we could blame the healthcare system. You can't blame it in Denmark, where everybody has the same access to excellent healthcare. So, I would like to give attribution, but I've forgotten who said it. But a wonderful take home is a living wage is the best medication there is. It'll reduce deaths of despair. It'll reduce out of wedlock pregnancies. It'll increase maternal survival. It'll do an awful lot. Uh, again, to bring it into COVID, you know, if you look at percentage of population in light green and percentage of COVID cases in dark green, you can see that if you're white, 
you had uh, much less COVID risk than if you were Hispanic or if you were African American. And not because of a genetic predisposition, but because the Hispanics, the African Americans were the quote essential workers who didn't have the luxury many of us did of working from home, but had to get on crowded public transportation and uh, couldn't uh, get a salary if they didn't go into work and lived in crowded environments where it was much harder to isolate yourself. How do we fix it? Um, in my ideal world, if I was the czar and could wave a magic wand, I would have universal health care in this country, single payer, Medicare for all, whatever you want to call it. Do you remember when uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare was passed? You would have thought that this was the end of the world, that this was socialized medicine, that this was the ruination of everything we hold dear. That was baloney. It, it was tinkering. It, was, it made some meaningful improvements. I think the idea that you could not be dropped from health insurance because of pre-existing illness, that you could not run out of money if you were unlucky enough to get a serious illness, you know, those were useful features, but it basically kept our existing system. And the reason it was, was because all those big lobbyists, the hospital industry, the insurance industry, the doctors, all of them were by essentially bought out. We're told, you know, we're not going to affect your income. We're just going to get you more paying customers. So all of them got on board with it. But it is not going to come any, it's not going to certainly lower costs by keeping our current system. Uh, a single payer system would give everybody a basic level of coverage. Uh, I'm not a socialist. I'm not a Pollyanna. The rich will always have more of everything than the poor. But everybody ought to have access to basic proven health care that is going to keep them alive longer. Let the rich have private rooms if they want to pay a little extra. Let them have plastic surgery. Let them have concierge doctors. But make sure that nobody in this country dies because they can't afford to get medical care. Single payer would get rid of or probably 20 of the 25% of administrative overhead and immediately save us money, even if you didn't lower any, any, any charges. Uh, but at the same time, it would allow a central purchaser to say, you know, what you're charging for this drug, this procedure is irrational, it's not worth it, and this is what we're going to pay you. Is it going to happen? No, it's not going to happen this year, um, if ever. Uh, the lobbying against it would be dramatic. Uh, a very uh, unfortunate example, when the, the Affordable Care Act, part of it was a very small, I think it was a 3% tax on medical devices that was to help subsidize insurance for the poor. Uh, these are very high priced, high profit items, but uh, the industry lobbied and uh, in December that was, uh, that was taken out of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, pharmaceutical medical product industry are huge, huge spenders on uh, congressional uh, election campaigns, lobbying, and we all know that we have the best government that money can buy. Uh, Connecticut, which uh, actually came very close to putting a public option into their uh, healthcare system, is also home to a number of big insurance companies, and they lobbied like mad and stopped that dead in its tracks. Part of the problem is that unless you have been personally affected by this, the support from the general public, especially the more educated public, the ones who have the most influence, is soft. You know, a lot of people listening to this talk have, I'm sure, good employer paid insurance, are not personally terribly worried. And until it hits you, it doesn't rise to the top of the things that you're going to spend your energy uh, lobbying for. It's much easier to stop something than it is to start something. 
uh, and uh, especially in healthcare, the sound bites, I can already see them coming. Uh, if you remember in Obamacare, we had the death panels. Uh, I'm sure somebody remembers that phrase. What the, Obama, what the Affordable Care Act did was say they would pay doctors to have end of life discussions with people when appropriate. Uh, speaking as a primary care clinician, I can say that is an exceedingly valuable service. You have somebody who is near the end of life and you want to sit down with them and get what their values are, what do they, you know, how do they want the, their final weeks, months to, to be dealt with. And it's a very useful service. But the Republican Party labeled that death panels. You know, the bureaucrats are going to kill grandma. So, you know, and that's what ran in the papers. Kaiser Family Foundation, which is a very, very good source of, of unbiased information about the healthcare system, surveyed a broad representative group of Americans and asked the same question, but they asked it in different, using different terminology. If they asked people, do you think that Medicare for all is a good idea? About two thirds uh, thought it was a good idea, a third thought it wasn't. Similarly, universal health coverage, majority thought it was a great idea. When you get down to socialized medicine, uh, it was about half and half. And these are, you know, you can, you know darn well that any attempt to come through with universal health care would be immediately labeled as socialized medicine. So what are we going to be able to do? We're going to have to work with what we have. One of the few positives uh, that makes me think maybe we're going to get off ground zero is that US employers who are now paying roughly $20,000 per employee for a family health plan are study, starting to come around to the idea that this is a problem that it's hurting their competitiveness, that uh, you know the $20,000 that they're paying for an employee health plan is money they can't give people in salary, they can't give their shareholders, and means that their costs are inherently higher than those in countries where the healthcare costs are not assumed by the employer. So maybe we're gonna get a little bit of lobbying uh, pushing back against big pharma and the hospitals. But simple fixes we could do right now, use some money to help get states expand Medicaid. The uninsured rate, which is about, is about 14, 15% nationally, ranges from only 7% in Vermont to almost 30% in Texas. And there's an awful lot of Texans who are in big trouble if they get sick make it easier to sign up on the exchanges, change the subsidies. At the moment, the subsidies drop off dramatically for small increments in salary. And uh, the other thing that ought to be, uh, a, I think a no brainer is to just outlaw the, uh, the health plans that uh, Trump was encouraging, which are really, really cheap. And they're really, really cheap because they don't do anything. They're great if you don't get sick. And if you get sick, you find out that that cheap plan that you thought he was covering you actually doesn't pay for much of anything. Instead of going to single payer for everybody, it might be a more viable option to gradually reduce the age of enrollment, maybe allow people to get down to 62 to sign into Medicare, maybe allow small employers who have more trouble and higher costs ensuring their employees to buy in with some partial subsidy. And something that I think could be done even separately from all of those is to mandate that hospitals and doctors have to charge uninsured patients Medicare rates and not what they do now, which is list price. You know, the worst of all possible worlds is if you have a little bit of money or you own a house or you have a small business but you don't have health insurance and you go into the hospital because you are going to get charged their book price which is more than anybody else would ever pay 
and they're going to hound you to your last dollar to get paid. So uh, I think that ought to be if you don't have choose to not get insurance, it does shouldn't mean that uh, you know needing your appendix out means you're going to be billed a hundred thousand dollars for something that uh, Medicare would pay four thousand dollars for. Practical takeaways: What can you do? I think uh, you know I encourage you to buy my book, share it. Start going to political meetings and asking people what they're going to uh, to do about our system. Bring it up on their radar. Prescription drugs, a lot of practical things you can do even right now. Number one, ask your doctor when they if there's a generic for what you're taking. Ask look for things like if there, you have a a drug that's not on your plan. You there are options. There's an outfit called GoodRx that'll let you go to a number of pharmacies and buy something much cheaper. Uh, when a drug gets uh, is expired, don't throw it out. Uh, it's been proven time and again that tablets, capsules will last for years beyond their so-called expiration date. So don't throw out those pills. They're still good. Um, I would ask you very strongly if you're interested in getting online information please don't go to dr google uh, because listings there are going to take you to all sorts of hucksters that have all sorts of advice that's really good for them not for you there's some wonderful information that the, the nih has really excellent information on almost any topic you'd care to discuss some of the larger hospital systems uh, may be a little geared to getting you to come to them, but they tend to have objective and useful information. When you go to the doctor, plan your visit in advance. So this is something that I saw time and again was somebody was in for a visit. I had, they had a very different agenda that I had, but they didn't tell me about it until my hand was on the doorknob. And you know you don't want to go in for your routine blood pressure check, have the doctor thanks, I'll see you in six months, and then say, oh by the way, doctor, I've had this terrible pain. You're not going to get as good an attention as you would if you go in saying, I know I'm here for my blood pressure, doctor, but can we start off with this problem that I think is more important? Prepare yourself by taking by bringing notes so that you don't forget things that are important to you. And during the visit, take notes. It has been demonstrated amply that by the time somebody walks out of the office door, they've forgotten at least half of what they were told. So write it down. If you have the option, bring a friend, bring a relative with you to, to be a second set of ears and maybe a, maybe a scribe. And for heaven's sakes, ask questions. Uh, the only dumb question is the one that you were embarrassed to ask. So please do not. And if you don't understand something and doctors tend to talk in doctor speak and not everybody talks that language. So ask for clarification. If somebody gives you a new diagnosis, especially a serious diagnosis, one that may involve life changing treatments, always get a second opinion. Second opinions in somewhere, Mayo Clinic uh, published a study in which people who went there for a second opinion had almost 20% where the diagnosis was completely wrong or there was a major, major change in what to do. So if it's a serious diagnosis, please be liberal in asking for, for another opinion. And if the doctor is insulted by it, get yourself a new doctor. A good doctor should never be insulted by that. If any, if you are up in my age group and uh, you have serious health problems, think about how you want to be treated, discuss it with your family well before the time comes when it becomes a critical issue, put it in writing, discuss it with your family and with your doctor so that uh, your family aren't in the position as happened so often in this recent pandemic. Somebody's on a, on a ventilator, can't talk, and doctor says, okay, what should we do? And you know, family have no idea what you would want. Make sure they know. 
All right, I've gone as quick as I could and hopefully we have time for comment, questions. Uh, I'm at your disposal. We do. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Hoffer. Um, an enormous amount of information. You confirmed, you know, a lot of things that I was thinking about, I'm sure, uh, in our audience as well. I'm glad that this is being recorded for others to be able to listen to your presentation. So um, we do have a few questions in the chat, which I will read to you. And the first one is, if you are going to offer the uninsured Medicare rates, doesn't that mean that you are realistically going to have to offer those same rates to private carriers? That is a um, certainly very interesting conundrum. I mean, the as you know, one of the bills that went through uh, last a year or so ago was that price transparency that hospitals were supposed to post for people to find out uh, the rates that they charge. And boy, have they bent over backwards to not do that. Uh, in many cases, you know, the information is there if you happen to have a degree in computer science. But short of that, it's almost impossible to find. Uh, they can, you know, all of the insurers consider that to be a trade secret. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, the fact is Medicare pays slightly under what a reasonable cost plus reasonable overhead and markup would be for a hospital. And they are subsidized up the gazoo by private insurers that are paying double and triple uh, that amount. So I think that, um, you know, short of changing our entire system, uh, I don't think you're gonna get everybody paying Medicare rates because uh, there are gonna be a lot of hospitals that uh, some are gonna go out of business and they'll all be very unhappy. But I don't see why if somebody has no money, uh, it shouldn't be mandated that they are, they have to give a lower rate. I mean, it's the same with the, you know, there's a lot of different approaches to legislation over surprise medical bills. Uh, depending on your viewpoint, it's either going to be unfair to the insurer, or it's going to be unfair to the doctor. Uh, you know, everybody wants the wants their bigger share of the pie, and there has to be a middle ground. I mean, everybody has to suffer a little bit, and I think that. Uh, you know, it would be reasonable to say if somebody is uninsured that you are gonna, you have to charge them the lowest negotiated rate. And we can make it that, doesn't have to be Medicare rates to be the lowest negotiated rate that you offer any insurer. But uh, certainly not list price. Okay. Um, we got a second question uh, that Lester has regarding Medicaid versus Medicare versus list price. Lester. Yeah, can, can I elaborate on my question, Juan? Yes, please. Yeah, Dr. Hoffer, uh, you talk mainly about uh, what hospitals are charging. I want to include in the discussion nursing homes and rehab facilities. I read in an article in AARP uh, magazine that uh, patients who are um, have Medicaid insurance are money losers, whereas patients who have Medicare are profitable patients. So my question to you is, what do we do about Medicaid? It seems to be part of the problem here for the providers. They can't make they can't make any money off of Medicaid patients from what I from what I'm hearing. So. Is your uh, outside of uh, eliminating Medicaid and converting these patients to Medicare, what else would you uh, propose? Well, you can't, uh, to be honest, you can't make a whole lot of money on Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, you know, I remember once uh, near, nearing the end of my private practice career looking at, you know, what I, 
build and what I collected. And having been in practice for a long time and having my patients age along with me, I was seeing a growing proportion of them on Medicare. And you know, when I bill a dollar to Blue Cross, I tend to get paid about 95 cents. When I bill a dollar to Medicare, I was getting about 40 cents. So, uh, you know, I was in the enviable position of having a very low overhead practice and I, you know, I could live with it. But uh, if you have a high overhead practice, uh, you, yes, you lose money. Uh, you lose money on both of them. You lose money on Medicare and Medicaid. One, no, of, the the one of the reasons that primary care doctors are increasingly on board with universal health care is they are the ones who are dealing with huge, huge overheads for uh, things like uh, billing clerks and people who spend all day on the phone getting prior authorizations for a test or a medication. And if you got moved over to a single payer system, yes, their incomes, gross incomes would go down, but their overhead would go down so much they'd come out probably, if anything, a little bit ahead. Um, so uh, Medicare in nursing homes is only short term. Medicare does not pay for custodial care. So if you right. have, uh, so the reason that uh, nursing homes like Medicare is they're paid rehab rates which only lasts for, you know, a certain number, maybe up to 30 days. And no more. I think it goes up to 100 in a calendar year. Yeah. At least in my experience, you could be, uh, get up to 100 days of reimbursement with Medicare. Yeah. And so they will, so they like to have those because they are paid yeah. at, a, at a rate that implies they're doing a lot for people. Uh, Medicaid almost invariably are, are people who are simply nowhere else to go. They, right. they, they, they can't live alone. They don't have family to take care of them. They've exhausted all their, uh, all their savings and now Medicaid is paying the nursing home. Um, and uh, so the nursing homes, unfortunately, then tend then cut costs by cutting what they pay their employees, uh, by cutting corners on an awful lot of things. So yeah, they, they do very well on the rehab patients, whether they're private, whether they're commercial insurance or Medicare, and they lose money on all the Medicaid patients. But they, I don't think anybody is gonna pay for so-called custodial care at a, at a higher rate, unfortunately. That's a, you know, a whole other topic is how do we deal with our sick and our old. Right. Thank you. Uh, we've got one more question uh, from Keith. Um, should I ask a doctor to recommend who to contact for second opinion, or should I go to another hospital for a second opinion? If you, I th it's certainly reasonable, especially if you have a good rapport with your doctor, uh, your primary care doctor to say, you know, I realize that Dr. X you sent me to is very good, but this is a really critical question for me. And I wonder if you can suggest somebody in a different, uh, you know, a different area, a different uh, network who might, I might see for a second opinion. Um, and you certainly don't want to see, you know, the, uh, the person who's in the next office. Um, but, uh, and if you don't feel comfortable asking your primary care doctor that, then I would simply, you know, look for it, go to one of the uh, local academic hospitals and see what you can do there. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, from Lawrence. Why do insurance companies put up with redundant care, voted prices, et cetera? It's all about ability to pass on costs to payers. And if so, why do payers put up with that? Uh, some payers have a, a lot left. So. Uh, it's an, they have very, very little motivation to reduce costs because most of them work on a cost plus basis. Uh, they simply raise their rates. Uh, and it, one area that somebody looked at a while back was why insurers almost never follow through on patient complaints of fraudulent billing. And uh, the answer is it's uh, they just don't care. 
uh, that goes into their cost base and uh, they raise, uh, they, they would just rather than get providers mad at them, they just up, up their costs. And uh, so they have very, very little motivation to, uh, to fight them down. There are other, other situations where in a market like Boston, where the hospitals sometimes have the upper hand. Uh, if you can imagine trying to sell a health insurance policy to a large employer and say, oh, by the way, you know, Mass General Brigham is not in our network because they were too expensive. Well, sorry, but our employees uh, love Mass General Brigham, so we'll have to get our insurance somewhere else. So that gives uh, MGB all the clout and uh, they basically charge whatever they feel like charging and insurers have to pay it. No, the question really is though, why do payers put up with that? If you're talking about uh, payers in the form of commercial insurance or you're talking yeah. about employers? Employers. Employers, I say, are finally uh, starting to notice that this is an issue. Um, it's, I, I had not really seen much movement on that until this last year when, uh, when the employers are starting to say, hey, this is getting out of hand. And uh, they may be, uh, and if enough of them get organized, uh, may be in fact able to start putting some counter pressure on it because uh, as I say, the the uh, the opposition to high prices has been thoroughly disorganized and disjointed, and the people that do the charging are very well organized and very focused. Uh, if we start getting a number of major employers to start saying this is a problem and we need to address it, Congress, maybe we're going to start seeing something happening. That is my fond hope. Yeah, my follow-up, which was not well articulated, uh, is actually the answer may be employers getting out of providing health insurance entirely. And it only started after World War II because there were price, uh, you know, wage, you know, uh, uh, laws that said you couldn't pay any more to employees. So they gave so they offered them health insurance as a perk right. to get them to come in. But imagine a world where employers don't provide health insurance. So the whole burden is on us. We're not going to put up with that, I don't think. And as individuals writ large, I think that provides the pressure. Yep, that would be, I mean, if you say, how can you imagine a world where employers don't pay health insurance? Sure, you look at a, pick a, take a map of the world and throw a dart and you'll probably hit one. Uh, we are the outliers that way in terms of having uh, employers responsible for uh, the health insurance. Uh, it's certainly not the rule. And uh, yeah. Get, uh, and by the way, if they don't pay medical insurance, which is huge, even though more and more the employee is paying a larger percentage of that, uh, they're more competitive because they have to bear that when they're uh, competing with companies based abroad, not only China, but including China, but France, England, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the companies become more competitive if that's not a cost you know, that they bear. So uh, it may actually be good all the way around. Yep, absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. All right, uh, great questions. Uh, on behalf of the MIT Club of Rhode Island, thank you so much, Dr. Hoffer, for your time and sharing really important information. As I said, I'm glad that uh, it is being recorded and we will put it on our website. So thank you very much. And that ends our recording. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you for attending. Thank you.